and welcome to Once Upon a Town, the show where we delve deep into Franklin history. I'm Eamon McCarthy Earls. I'm Joe Landry. Joe, what will we be talking about today? Today we're going to talk about the new Moss Block. And I know you're probably thinking, and maybe the viewers are thinking, well, wait a minute, we covered the Moss Block. Well, we covered the Moss Opera House Block. But as we will see, this is a picture that shows the Moss Opera House Block on the right side. On the left side is the new Moss Opera House Block, uh, the new Moss Block. Um, that was that was uh, developed in uh, 18, uh, roughly 1889, 1890, about a year after the Morse Opera House block was developed. Uh, Aaron Hartwell Morse was uh, very busy the, those, in those three or four years. Uh, when you think about it, he developed the Morse Opera House block around 1888, and across the street they developed that in 1890 and 91, and uh, within a span of about four years, he totally rebuilt that whole area of town. Now this is a picture that I took from Google Earth, which I absolutely love. It shows what it looks like today. Um, the building to the left, the far left, is the A.J. Cataldo building. We'll talk about that, uh, actually we'll talk about it in a future presentation. The Sentinel building is in the middle, and we, it's called the Sentinel building uh, because the Franklin Sentinel moved there in the 1940s. And then the building on the far right is what's there today. That's which was put up, I think, around 2007 or 2008 there. Roughly that, right. And uh, that's where the Morse block was uh, basically developed. Now, back in 1879, uh, we had this drawing of Franklin, uh, and it shows uh, the empty lot across the street from uh, where the Morse Opera House block would be developed, and that's where the new, Mo the new Morse block would be d constructed. The, the arrow points to the building that was, over the years, was known as the Hawthorne. That was Aaron Hotwell Morse's house. On, that was on the corner of Summer Street and Central Street. And Central Street at that time was Central Street. Uh, it was only until 1913 when uh, it became East Central and West Central. Now today we'll talk about these buildings. Corson's Market, McPherson Furniture, the Lodge Brick Building, and the Sentinel Building. These are the ones we'll talk about in today's presentation. Corson's Market will be the first one. This is the building that was Corson's Market. Uh, and the, as the clipping shows, from 1887, uh, he Aaron Hotwell Morse would move his gas house. I'm not sure what a, what a gas house hmm. would be. Uh, looks like a regular building to me, but uh, he moved his gas house to the vacant lot opposite the opera house, where it will be fitted up for a meat market and occupied by David W. Corson, who intends to auction meat two evenings each week. The idea of auctioning meat is an interesting one. I know it. Yeah. Uh, and the building was moved there, and that building was moved there before, uh, before the brick building was constructed. This picture shows the brick building, but um, I want, I, that's one of the better pictures that I could show when it was there. So. Now here's from the, the uh, Sanborn fire map of 1889, and you can see that the market is now there, the arrow points to that. Uh, and I, I drew in some red lines to show where Alpine Row mm. would one day be. It wasn't there at that time. And then, uh, in later years, Corson's Market would be sold to a gentleman by the name of Fremont M. Richardson, F. M. Richardson. And back, but back, just to give you a little history of Mr. Richardson, back in the early 1880s, he was in a partnership with James O. Chilson over in the Chilson Block. Uh, the Chil uh, uh, Mr. Chilson had a, a, a store there, and it was known as Richardson, uh, Chil Chilson and Richardson. And that clipping from, uh, from the 1884 uh, business directory shows that. But at some point, uh, Chilson moved out and, uh, and then uh, Richardson became partners with Mr. Emerson. So it became Richardson and Emerson. And I'm pretty sure that might be the year that, uh, that uh, Austin B. Chilson moved, uh, established his business over on Depot Street. So it was around that time, so I'm kind of thinking that's what happened there. But Fremont Richardson was in, uh, was there, and he uh, he would eventually be in, uh, he would eventually become the owner of Corson's Market, at which point then he would rename it Richardson's Market. And you can see the picture; it shows Richardson's Market, and there's a an advertisement uh, that was taken from the 1909 business directory. And Fremont Richardson would eventually sell that market to his son, Edgar Richardson. And then in July of 1930, uh, according to the uh, 
um, one of the uh, clippings from 1930s Franklin Sentinel, uh, Edgar Richardson would sell his, mar his market to Charles Quinn. He was a former employee of uh, that market, and uh, he would rename it Quinn's Market. Such an interesting pattern of, uh, you see a lot of times the, the employees end up buying the market, That's right. to, uh, changing the name and That's updating right. it at one location. And it goes one step further. In 1954, in July, <clears throat> Charlie Quinn retired and he sold it to one of his employees, <laughs> Jimmy O'Connell. And he renamed it O'Connell's Market. And then on the day that he retired, Charlie Quinn, uh, they took this picture from one of the Chilson films. Uh, and Jimmy O'Connell's The Gentleman on the Right. And then in the 1960s, that building was used for the Woonsocket Call newspaper. They had a branch office there. And many newspaper carriers would go there and get their newspapers from a gentleman by the name of Harold Gilbert. But as we've mentioned many, many times, he had a nickname, Dutchie, Dutchie <laughs> Gilbert. In fact, uh, there was quite a story. Uh, he was a, he, Dutchie Gilbert used to be a, a local newspaper uh, reporter for the Wasaka Call in Franklin. And during World War II, he was sent to some place in the South Pacific, but he wasn't allowed to say where he was. So he got a letter, to, he sent a letter home, and he was a little bit cryptic when, it, when he said, don't bother sending the newspaper down here to where, uh, where I am. Uh, uh, to that, to that, uh, the new, we have the newspaper uh, carriers, uh, the newspaper reporters down here in the Mariana Islands. So don't bother sending the newspaper to to us. And so it was his little way of saying that this is where I am. But it got past the census. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of cool. So. And then in the 70s, Fico Shoe Store would relocate from Depot Street, and that's probably around the time that they demolished the buildings uh, on on Main Street. So then Fico's moved to here. Now McPherson Furniture, that's the next build, the next one we'll talk about. Uh, and he did business in the building to the far right on the Morse block. But before those buildings were even built, uh, in the, according to this notice in the November 17th, 1883 Franklin Sentinel, Robert L. McPherson opened up a furniture and undertaking business in a building on Central Street. And that building was opposite uh, Central Street, and it was up opposite Cottage Street. And uh, it was opposite Cunningham Stable, as the article says. Um, but this was seven, seven years before the, the new Morse block was constructed, so it was just that building was moved there. And this map, uh, the, fire, the, the Sanborn fire map shows uh, the building as being there. Uh, and you can see down on, across the street on the corner of Cottage Street, you can see where it says Carriage House. Uh, I'm pretty sure that would be uh, the, the Cunningham stable that they talked about. Um, and you can see the word undertaker on the building that the arrow points to. Mm -hmm. So that's where Mr. McPherson be began doing business there. Plenty of nice uh, pine wood furniture. Um, absolutely. <laughs> and he sold furniture to the dearly departed. <laughs> yep. And then in 1890, when they developed, they started developing the, Morse, the new Morse block, the first building that was built was this building. This was on the corner of Alpine Row. And in 1890, he moved his furniture and undertaking business into this building. But that same year, he also partnered up with Alfred Farrington. Uh, he went into partnership with Mr. McPherson in the furniture business. And both gentlemen are well known in town. And with increased stock, they will cater to the wants of furniture buyers be uh, better than in past. Both are gentlemen whom it is a pleasure to meet and worthy of a liberal share of trade. So that's pretty good. So, yeah. And then one of their employees, his name was Leslie E. Wigan, and he worked in the, Fa the Farrington establishment. And this article from the December 6, 1907 Franklin Sentinel mentioned how he went to, he took his examination in Boston for. Uh, for, for embalming. So he, he, he got his diploma, so he, he, he must have uh, taken over the undertaking business uh, in, that, uh, in that business. And then uh, in uh, 1913, Franklin Business Directory showed this, this advertisement and it showed the picture. And by now, of course, the, the larger brick building had been built. And so that's that, that, uh, that building, undertaking a specialty. Now, in 19, also in 1913, this article appeared. 
The Farrington Furniture Store had been sold to a gentleman by the name of Harry Davis. And Mr. Saltman of Boston will conduct it under the name of Boston Furniture. Hmm. And as stated before, now they had, the article got it wrong, said Lester S. Wigan, but we know it's Leslie, had purchased the undertaking branch and will conduct that personally. And for a lot of our viewers, remember Wigan's funeral home on the mm -hmm. corner of uh, East Street and West Central Street, right next to the fire station. So that's where he, uh, he took his business. And then in December of 1913, there was this uh, article. It was in uh, the, the Sentinel. And it shows that Franklin Furniture had just put up a new sign. So it's possible that they said, Boston Furniture? No, it's Franklin Furniture. I mean, we're in Franklin. So he changed it. Now the large brick building. Here's the article from May of 19, 1890, and it says the workmen are busy on the cellar wall of Mr. Morse's new block opposite the Opera House. The building will be of brick, and, and the fill, it will fill in the land between Corson's Market and McPherson's Furniture Store. So that nails it down. That's when that building was built. I also think it's interesting. It's got the Union Light and Power Company listed there. Mm -hmm. Yep, they, they had moved to that location from across the street. Uh, and we'll see in a few minutes that they expanded into the st uh, one of the other stores. So, yep. Now this picture uh, was taken probably, I'm guessing around the mid, uh, probably the mid 1890s. Um, it shows Farrington Furniture, the brick building, shows Corson's Market. But I, I point to the building that McPherson's Furniture was, mm -hmm. and then they moved to the other one. So you can, it's a, it's a picture of the actual building that uh, the McPherson Furniture first started out in. It's probably the only picture I've ever seen of that building, mm. so, yeah. And it seems that back in uh, 1891, there, were short, there was a shortage of school uh, rooms. So because of the large number of pupils in the lower grammar department, the school committee decided to build a new school up in the Morse's new block and Mrs. Gertrude Bly was the teacher. Yeah. And the Sanborn Fire Map from 1894 shows that the, the block has now been developed. We see the furniture store in the corner of uh, Alpine Row. Uh, we see the, the brick building. Uh, there was a hardware store to the far left. Uh, we see on the second and third floor, we see photo. Um, there was a, a Vessi, uh, uh, photo photography studio that hmm. was on Central Square, and I'm pretty sure that's what that's referring Interesting. to. Central Square was that area of Central Street right in front of those buildings. Uh, I saw an article that said that they had decided to name that Central Square, so hmm. whenever you see that reference to Central Square, it was in that location. And then uh, this notice appeared in 1914, and it shows that Franklin Furniture expanded into the built into the store that was to the far right in the brick building. So now Franklin Furniture is now at 2729 East Central Street, 29 being the furniture mm -hmm. building, the original building. <clears throat> and uh, one thing about Mr. Saltman, Freddie Saltman, uh, he was a very generous and a very kind and generous man. Uh, he would extend credit to people before extending credit was really fashionable. Um, you know, many people uh, they just couldn't afford it, so he said, oh, just give me a little bit each week, and people always paid their bills, and a lot of times if you bought furniture from him, he'd throw in an extra lamp or whatever. Mm -hmm. a nice man. I've seen so many postings of, uh, of him on Facebook, and yeah, everybody's just a, a kind word for him. Nice man. Yeah. One of the other businesses that was in the brick building was Wesley, S. D uh, Wes Wesley F. Dismore. He owned a hardware store there. And a gentleman that's very familiar to a lot of people from over the years was uh, Herbert C. Stewart. He had a store there called the Franklin Pr Job Print Shop, and he was the manager there. And this picture was taken around 1914, probably during a parade. And um, we see in the in, in the back of the in the back of the, uh, the the wagon, we see Herbert Stewart right there. Hmm. And I did verify that with one of his uh, one of his relatives that that is Herbert Stewart. I like the uh, sign in the background there from the, the furniture store, Quaker Ranges, Bacon Guaranteed. Right. In fact, in a, in a few minutes, you're going to see the actual, one of the, uh, one of the advertisements for Quaker Ranges. So we'll, we'll see that that was uh, that furniture store. Mm -hmm. 
And then a little close up of Herbert Stewart. And for over 70 consecutive years, he would play taps on his bugle in, uh, at the cemeteries and march in the parade. Uh, he was Incredible. a fixture. Uh, for over 70 years, he was very proud of that. He would he actually turn down work so that he could march in that parade. And uh, in later years, he, he decided he better ride in the car instead of uh, marching the, the whole parade route. But uh, so many of the Chilson films, I mean, show him marching in that parade. Hmm. Yep. And then, like I said, here's an article that I, an advertisement that I saw in 1914 and Quaker Rangers and Franklin Furniture. So, yep. The little Quaker character there. <laughs> I know that. Mm -hmm. And then the hardware store in that uh, building was E.A. Walton. That was Eben A. Walton. He had a hardware store there. He sold paints and uh, oils and wallpaper, bicycles. Sherwin Williams paint. I, I was, I was, uh, I was surpri I'm surprised that that brand existed so commonly. I know that it. Far back. I know it. Cover the earth. <laughs> Actually, in later years, Franklin uh, uh, Sherwin Williams would have a uh, store right at the in uh, the Ray Block, right on the corner of Dean Avenue. Mm -hmm. And then here's the article where Union Light actually uh, took over the Walton store. They uh, added to their store. A lot of times we'll see that where. Uh, stores would expand into stores that have been vacated and then grow the store like Newberry's mm. and W.T. Grant was another good case in point. Or oh, Franklin Furniture, as we'll see here. They, they expanded uh, from the, the Farrington building to the, that store, then really took over the whole, the, the, whole, uh, the whole building, literally. And Freddie Saltman actually owned that building. He, he had apartments upstairs he would rent out. And, yeah. But in the early 2000s, the building mm -hmm. had to be, the buildings were demolished, and uh, of course, you know, they were built in the 1890s, so they were really getting old. And today, that's what the block looks like. So. And this, it's interesting with this building, because I know there was controversy when it was originally put up, mm. a conflict in some ways between people that uh, envisioned some kind of New England downtown, but a New England downtown that looked quite a bit like Southern California with this mm. rather unusual yeah. uh, white brick building here. At this mm. point, it's, it's pretty much a part of the downtown, now a hub for, for some really interesting local businesses like Maguro House, Japanese restaurant, ah. or Cake Bar. Um, mm -hmm. But it's very interesting because a large part of that building now is actually Dean College dorms, the oh. upper part. Oh, wow. So that's actually had a had some of a, some bit of a role in restoring some foot traffic and commerce to that section of downtown, it seems like, mm. a lot of seen um, students walking up and down Main Street. Sure, that's good. Hmm. Now the Sentinel Building. The Sentinel Building is the building in the middle. Uh, it was not, uh, it was constructed in the early 1900s. Uh, it wasn't called the Sentinel Building at the time it was constructed because the Sentinel, the, the, the Sentinel office was down on Depot Street. They had a so-called Sentinel Building down there. Uh, uh, but they moved, the Sentinel would move to this building in 1940 and so, for lack of a better name, I call it the Sentinel Building. Uh, this is the location where the Sentinel Building was built, um, and this was before the block was developed. And from the 1888 map of Franklin, or the drawing, I should say, it was really a map, it was a drawing, uh, we can see building number 38 was the Corson Market, building number 61 was the William H. Spear and Son Steam Laundry. Now in later years, that would become Waterman's Laundry. A lot of times when we look at the older pictures of down that area, and actually we'll see it in an upcoming picture, we'll see Waterman's Laundry. Hmm. But it, it was originally built as Spear's Laundry. Um, that building is number 63 uh, in the picture. That's, a, that's the building with the flag. Hmm. And, uh, and that building was also where there was another uh, uh, another store that was uh, William H. Spear had. It was called the Fish and Oyster Store. And also in that same building, Edward E. King had a barber shop. Now Edward E. King would eventually move across the street to the building that was on the bridge uh, where, where the Bullock and Oil Company was. He would actually build that building. Uh, that was around a in 1894 or so. so. But Edward E. King started there. Kind of an incredible variety of businesses for a pretty small location. Absolutely. And then on the side of the building, there was this little, tiny, little building. In later years, that was uh, where Jimmy's uh, liquor store and Jimmy's candy store was, an ice cream store. But it was originally built as a store where uh, a gentleman by the name of Albert Jordan 
He made and repaired boots uh, and shoes in that small store. Eventually that would become Cataldo's fruit stand, and we'll talk about that in a future episode, but that's, where, that's what that was. Now this arrow points to the building where M Mr. McPherson first started doing business, and you can see now that Waterman Laundry is now hmm. there. Um, now Corson's, uh, the building between Corson's Market and Waterman's Laundry, uh, that's the building that would be demolished and replaced by the Sentinel Building sometime in the early 1900s. I have not seen any anything in the Sentinel that actually said when the building started. That's but, interesting. Yeah, but I'm guessing, looking at all the pictures and trying to piece it together, I'm guessing early 1900s, that's when that was built. And then this was the 1889 Sanborn map, and the arrow points to that building, like I said, where uh, Mr. McPherson did business as the undertaker. And you can see the laundry building uh, had been erected, and that was ne uh, directly to the left of the McPherson building. Mm. And you can see the market on the, on the bottom. And you can see the little cobbler shop up there. Remember I was saying that that's where the fruit stand was. But, and you can see uh, music. I'm not sure what, what the music was, but uh, apparently in that, at that time there was a music store in there. But uh, up with the cobbler, that's definitely where uh, he was. And then uh, in the, one of the first businesses in the Sentinel Building, before it was the Sentinel Building, was Franklin Buick. And uh, that, this advertisement appeared in August of 1936. We all wish we could buy a Buick for $765 these days, but that's right. might head straight to the scrapyard if you did that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's right. And then in 1940, the Sentinel did move. Um, like the article says, just in case some of our friends have missed our previous announcements, uh, we will remind you that the office and printing plant is now located at 1517 East Central Street. Di diagonally across the corner of Cottage Street. In our new premises, with added new equipment, uh, new floor and everything, uh, they stand ready to prove our, our statement and hope you will challenge us. Hmm. So, they plan two evenings for open house and will advise you well in advance as you may drop in and witness printing presses in operation. So that was really something. So, yeah. And then in December of 1941, Albert Ralston, editor of the Franklin Sentinel, retired. Uh, again, this is from the, one of the Chilson films. And he was, uh, he's, he's seen in the doorway. Um, and he retired in 1941. And then the Sentinel building was, was purchased. Um, it, was, uh, it was purchased by the Sentinel. Uh, no, I'm sorry, it was caught. <laughs> Okay. And this entry was taken from the September 3rd, 1953, Franklin Sentinel. Um, and uh, oh, the, per the, the newspaper was actually, per the building was actually purchased by the Franklin Sentinel. They moved there in 1940, but they had essentially been renting prior to that time. E exactly. But the thing I found interesting was the article says it was purchased from the Morse estate. So the Morse family apparently had controlled that, that location uh, yeah. up until then. So uh, the speaker, Joe, Joe Martin, he was the publisher of the Sentinel, and, uh, and also, Joe Martin also uh, owned the, the Evening Chronicle over in uh, North Attleboro. So he had both of those newspapers, and a lot of, wow, times, so a lot of times you would see newspaper uh, articles and things, and it would refer to both the, 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 the Chronicle and also the Sentinel. A lot of advertisements too. You see a lot of North Attleboro advertisements in the Sentinel, hmm. and you'll see a lot of Franklin uh, advertisements in the Chronicle. So, and then this picture was taken from the 1960s. Uh, John Rizzoli had moved uh, his pharmacy into this location. Previous to that, he was across the street on the corner of Cottage Street, um, and then the Sentinel Press uh, gave up half the building apparently and they moved, they took over to the right side, and uh, that's where they were, so. Well, Joe, it's been fascinating retracing the story of the new Morse block mm -hmm. and seeing how the Morse family ended up developing their property across the street from the famous Mor Morse Opera House, mm -hmm. and really all the, all the changes that have happened in that spot, even very recently with the demolition of Franklin Furniture only about a decade ago, mm -hmm. and its replacement with that new uh, white brick building there. Mm. Until next time, I'm Eamon McCarthy Earls. And I'm Joe Landry. Thanks for watching.
This program was made possible by your Franklin friends and neighbors. Good folks, just like you. Thanks for supporting Franklin TV. And thanks for watching.